Thank you so much for telling us about Jhumhoon and its activities. It's really uh, very inspiring, this, this whole enterprise that has been going on since so many years. And thank you for asking me today to present. And most of all, uh, I'm so happy to see all of you here and uh, really thankful for you uh, that you all made it possible to come. Thank you very much. Maybe it's good to record long silences because then we can stop thinking about words and start thinking about being and also start looking. And that, for example, can we have this light off, please? this side, man. This side. So maybe it's good to record long silences because then we can stop thinking about words and start thinking about being and also start looking. For example, at that. What is that? It is a sculpture made out of paper. It is like a garment. It is also like a pair of wings. But above all, when you look at it, it gives you a sense of being worn, covering the body and being worn, used and used. So it contains experience. And when we bring artworks together with artists, we are bringing together an incredible density of experience. And that experience has an energy which then begins to be redistributed. Not by any systematic law, but by spontaneous interaction. Now these lines which I just told you about are uh, from an introduction written by John Berger. John Berger was an internationally famed artist, art critic. and. Uh, he wrote an introduction for a show which was titled The Search Within, showcasing the works of Indian and Austrian artists. The work that he refers to is my work. I chose these lines in particular because they hit the nail on its head. The nail that I have held in constant focus during the changing patterns of my journey as an artist. Experience. The intensity of the experience, not just the experience, but the intensity behind the experience when which an artwork happens, comes into being, is what charges the artwork with energy. In other words, it makes it come alive, gives it life. And this energy, this life, in turn is transmitted to the spectators through direct interaction, evoking responses on multiple levels. Having said that, let me take a leap backwards and tell you how it all began. I was very fond of drawing. As a school going kid, I used to draw till 2 o'clock at night, my dolls, tea sets, china wear and lots of other objects. The margins of my notebooks were full of squiggly little lines, mostly faces. And it was my parents, both of them, who were responsible for giving me a very uh, firm grounding in us since my childhood. My mother would, uh, she enrolled me in art classes. She would take me to All India Radio Station so that I could participate in radio plays. 
And then she also made me join Bharatnatyam classes. A little later, my father agreed to a proposal put forward to him by a friend of his who was a drama producer when he said that he needed a child artist for his new production. And there I was, on professional stage at the age of about 11. <coughs> and there begins my penchant for theatre, which till today is alive and kicking. It has contributed a great deal to the vocabulary that I have developed to make my work. I have used theatre in many different ways, drama in different ways, both for my visual and my performative work. In the last year of school, I was uh, doing professional plays and uh, during college time, there were, every year there were intercollegiate one act play competitions which saw our college and me on stage. And a little le later, I also co-founded a theatre group called Anagat. We did about six productions a lot and uh, the very, and one of the productions was uh, uh, invited to perform at the very first Bombay Arts Festival, which was dedicated to the sculptor Prabhu Kanala in 1988. If you want to be financially independent, you should take commercial art. That is what my father said to me when I let him know that I had opted to study art instead of medicine. Yeah, medicine was also a contender that time. I listened to my father's advice. I found it very sound. And I joined JJ Institute of Applied Art, went through the five years and emerged a qualified graphic designer. And let me tell you, not for a moment do I regret that decision because it gave me a certain discipline it honed certain skills which would not have been possible had I trained as a fine artist. No sooner had I stepped out of college, two directions opened up for me. One was a confirmed job with a very fine ad agency of that time, creative unit. And the second was that Mr. Pandor of Pandor Art Gallery needed an assistant. There is no reward for guessing which job I chose. <laughs> of course I joined Pandol Art Gallery because that is what I wanted to practice fine arts and this was a perfect opening. So for the next three years, I lived art. I slept art, I walked art, I ate art, I breathed art. Not only, uh, not only was I designing invites and catalogs for the shows, I was also visiting artist studios, looking at their work, talking about the works with them, choosing the works for our gallery, and also uh, talking about art to uh, buyers and prospective, you know, art lovers who, who would walk into the gallery. I also traveled out of the city to look after shows organized by Pandol independently. And of course, Every show that we had, I had to sit and write 800 envelopes, the address is on 800 envelopes, sometimes shared by Mr. Pandol, this responsibility. So this was my ashram, where I received a very, uh, very sound training and an all-encompassing feel I received of the contemporary Indian art world then. After three years of Pandol, I started my own design and art consultancy studio, Art and Attitudes, in partnership with Bhadrakan Javeri, who was a playwright, director, actor on the Gujarati stage. <coughs> I had started to paint whilst in Pandol, and I had developed uh, uh, very, very sound uh, friendships, you know, comradeships with artists like Prabhakar Barve, Dilip Ranade. And 12 of us, we decided to form a group called Astitva. Astitva meaning isness, being, which was in response to uh, the dependency which an artist faced on uh, the dependency on commercial galleries when the artist wanted to show or, you know, project his work. There were only two galleries to speak of that time, Kemol and Pandol, and it was well nigh impossible to get into them. So, 
we decided that each member of Astitva would contribute 10 rupees per month, build up a fund, and whenever one of us wanted to have a solo show on our own, we would, we would give that money towards expenses. And when there was no show ha happening, we would buy a painting from an out-of-station artist who perhaps was showing on his own, on, on her own. So very laudable intentions. But Astitva <coughs> folded it up after one year. It, mm, the Twelve of us were too many for it to coexist in harmony. So although my visual art practice began as a graphic designer, it uh, gradually started uh, shifting in the direction of fine arts and has developed into a multi-pronged art practice. Like the palm of our hands, you know, with fing fingers shooting out. Or to give you a more dramatic example, like a, an octopus waving its tentacles in different directions. What is happening on, in, on, on this surface sort of reminds me of what I've just told you about my art practice. The line drawing with needle and thread, a web-like structure with no discernible beginning or end. Trails going off in all directions. This work is from the realm of the elusive series where I had worked with transparent nylon fabric stretched on wooden frames. The very same screens which the screen printers used to print on fabric. That was my canvas for this show. So as I told you, what is happening on this, on this surface? is almost like what I told you about my art practice. Lines wander off into space, break off, switch directions. Their only intention seems to be to spread and grow and uh, make connections in the process of their journey. Forever developing new beginnings, forever in a process of growing. Look how they also bridge void forms, gaps, which is no hurdle for them. They create bridges and connections even across voids. The totality of the image is that of a captured moment of this process of growing. When transparent nylon fabric is stretched taut on frames, the sheer expanse of the fabric evokes three qualities basic to my experience of space. Crystalline clarity, unruffled stillness, and permeable <coughs> transparency. The urge to explore the absent presence of space has led me towards materials which are, which seem to be almost not there. They are not interested in asserting their physicality, rather they are interested in, in dissolving into the surrounding space. The kind that, you know, I, I've used dry people leaves very often also in my work, which we shall see later on. And it's almost as though it, it, it's a whisper. It's, it's identity, it's assertion, it's almost a whisper. So here three screens are embedded one behind the other. There are three screens. And the work is like an opened up map of memory. The memories closest to our consciousness are seen clear and distinct. Like, like the cut out shapes that we see, through these shapes we are looking at what is happening on the screen behind. And uh, whereas those which are further removed, the memories which are further removed are hazy and indistinct like, like areas here behind which are a little fuzzy and not so sharp. So these works reflect recall in time on the screen of memory. Here there are two screens, one behind the other. Through the cutout shape, which is... These, these grey half moon like shapes are cut out from the first screen through which we are looking at the second screen and the cutouts from the second screen which are these white shapes 
we see the white of the wall. So even the wall becomes part of the work and we get the feel of the dimension. And there's a first line of a Gujarati poem which is inscribed on top here. The letters are cut out and then stitched and, and engineered so that they stay in space. If you people are interested in uh, knowing what it is, I can recite it or we'll continue. Yes, please. Okay. Um, it's in Gujarati, so, uh, and it's by one of the first Gujarati modern poets. His name was Kavi Kant. Aaj Maharaj Jadapar Udaya Joy Ne Chandralo. Today, O Lord, seeing the rise of the moon above the waters. And in the poem it goes, Rudayamaj Harshajame, which means joy gathers in the heart. But I have left it unstated here because any other emotion can gather in our hearts here. The, here, uh, I started this work with the cutout uh, of my palm impression. That is the starting point of this work. Uh, um, palm impression as a void form, the presence of an absent presence. One dilemma which faced me in the early years was what to paint and how to paint. On what basis do I decide what to paint and how to paint? Is it like tossing a coin with which to decide? How to discover the ground, the foundation that would give me the surety of conviction, which would allow me to, you know, for my involvement not to break and continue without getting bored. I discovered that one realizes and learns how to paint and how not to paint by painting itself. Discovery number one. When I put the dilemma which bothered me, like what to paint, how to paint, when I put it aside, I did not bother my mental space with doubts and negative thoughts of any kind. I noticed that when I just began, just began without hesitancy and continued without creating a doubt in my mind, I became aware of an undercurrent a constant which was working to keep the act together, both me and the painting simultaneously flowing to the dictates of rhythm through which all action and its outcome was happening. My process is based on rhythm as the thread that binds, creates connections and builds the work as one whole. As a child, I often wondered what is it that, um, you know, makes me want to move, raise my hand, reach out and move? Who or what is it that propels me? Not finding any answers to that question, the mystery remained intact as is. Flash forward to when I was working on my first body of work for a group show in 1991. The central motif in this series is a rope form. Many friends and others would drop by to see my work. And more often than not, the question why rope kept popping up. I mean, when you're painting portraits or landscapes, still lives, nobody asks you why. But rope? Of course. Why rope? I, for the life of me, did not know why rope. I was painting rope because I wanted to very urgently, very badly, very passionately. And I needed no other justification for painting ropes. But the question was staring in my face, why ropes? So, in an attempt to point at the direction in which the answer might lie, I wrote the following. Throb of a presence, a desire to unfold, to move, to reach out. Within me is something with which I constantly interact. I cannot catch it. It refuses to be pinned down. Again and again, my attempts at explaining it to myself fail. 
and I am filled with an emotion of wonder. As I dive deeper into this mystery, I see a form somewhat like this. Kondvi, the unseen umbilical cord, <coughs> twist upon twist, torsion. Millions of strands flying, hurtling, rippling, undulating, generating motion, propelling the self. Entwining, uniting, parting, circles in the making. Now what was happening here? I mean, what was I getting out of writing this? Well, to begin with, I was gaining an insight into the question, why rope? Becoming aware of the connection between the protagonist's rope and that mystery which lay gestating within me like a fetus in the womb. The very form of the rope, the strategy that it applies for creating its own body by twisting upon itself, twist upon twist, extending, moving as it creates itself, seems to suggest that it is physically imitating the characteristic of life itself, which is to grow, to move, through its inbuilt drive to be, its prana, so to say, to reach out, move and perform action through no other agency but itself. Like the life force, the rope form is a never-ending self-creating process, constantly involved in birthing multiplicity of, its, of itself in various forms. The rope then becomes a metaphor here for life force the impetus which propels me to reach out and move. That was the mystery that lay gestating within me. Realizing the nature of the life-generating impulse has been my ongoing preoccupation as an artist and as a human being. Which brings me to an experiment which I made myself undergo during the early years of practice. I was desperately seeking answers related to self, inner voice, truth, authenticity, such fundamental questions. One question that kept haunting me was that how can I be sure that when I what I recognized as my inner voice was real and not a fiction of uh, my mind had conjured up to fool me into believing that I was on the right track when I unquestioningly surrendered to the silent flow of its rhythm during painting. So when I was at one with the painting and painting and I felt it was my inner voice which was guiding me and there was perfect flow, how, how do I know it's real and not a fiction? So to test it, I consciously chose to deliberately go against what I spontaneously and freely wanted to do on the canvas. I rebelled and would do exactly the opposite of what I wanted to do. I completed the painting in this way, will you mean me? And I had so thoroughly confused myself by now that I was in no position to react what had happened before me. Since I had decided not to trust myself, I had banished feeling from my field of experience. I showed this painting to my friend and partner who was an artist in his own right and whose sensitivity towards visual arts I had very often uh, experienced. He immediately sensed the mess that the painting was and asked me what the hell was I up to. When I told him what I had done and why, his response was that this could be a most powerful lesson for me if, if I allowed myself to see it for itself that it was the answer to the question haunting me and had shown me how not to paint. It had shown me that it is imperative to trust myself completely, implicitly, without the slightest hesitation <coughs> or doubt, to completely surrender to the authority of the inner voice and act in sync with its directions. This is a state of mind. It is a state of being, a state of mind in which one has to situate oneself in. Then only one is able to flow in rhythm with oneself as one and not two identities, 
as us and not you and me. There is a very apt word in Sanskrit for this state of being, tadatmya, to be as though one. Ever since this has been my process, the decisions taken are not arbitrary or tentative. They are backed by clarity of vision which is holistic and not atomistic. This process of working gives me the inner certitude of being on the right track. So much so that at times I have felt when I am totally at one with the moment that I could continue to work even if there was no light in the room. As though the actions, the strokes, the movements know what is needed. The force of the inbuilt internal logic that guides the hand unerringly stems from within the work itself. Around 1995, I decided to close the design studio art and attitudes and uh, practice only as a fine artist. This was a major turning point of my life and my career. By now, the object rope had started appearing in my work, actual rope. And I began to use paper and rope as my two basic materials. Began using my hands to work with paper, molding, giving shape to the paper. It was then that I became aware, when, when I was working with my hands with paper, I became aware of the connection between the paper body and my body between the paper's skin and my skin. Paper, like our skin, can be creased, wrinkled, torn, pierced, sutured, repaired. Tearing, creasing, folding and again smoothing, smoothening is part of the process that shapes the paper body. This section of the work, there were two sections to this body of work. This section of the work was more or less white, translucent and the source of light had to be from behind the work. When light penetrates the paper body, the interior space of the body lights up and its hidden interior landscape appears decoded before our eyes. Like an x-ray held up to right, when you want to see our internal organs, what is happening, we have to take an x-ray and see it against light. The inner, the non-material world is what this section is about. The works are engaged in revealing their intimate private stories by opening up to us. Unless that inner world stands exposed to our eyes, their stories would remain invisible. This technique does precisely that, makes the invisible visible. So again, the question was, why was I working this way, you know, tearing paper and why we had to see it? Because this section referred to the internal, the non-visible, the non-apparent and hence the technique of feeling and showing what was happening inside. So you see, one thing leads to another, leads to another. So it's, it's a mutually dependent uh, journey, the material, the work and uh, my experience as a human being. Since the second section, this is, a, this is part of the second section which referred more to the uh, outer, more material and physical realities of life. They were opaque, suffused with colour and hung directly on the wall. I have moulded paper into distinct shapes, imbuing each of them with individual identities. So the works in the first section had to be hung away from the wall. This one is quite a large work, it couldn't be framed, it was hanging like we hang clothes to dry. I had special stands made for that. And uh, so they had to be uh, hung away from the wall and lit from behind. And here it is the reverse. They are opaque and they go straight on the wall. So the play of complementarities between the two sections, opaque, translucent, inner, outer, 
hidden overt alludes to how life plays out before us no day without light no pleasure without pain no gain without a loss and of course no life without the play of dualities again realizing the nature of the life generating impulse has been my ongoing uh, ongoing concern as an artist and as a human being again the same lead uh, motif pervades the dream of my life the sun is shining it is neither too hot nor too cold we are together on a journey climbing an expanse of earth brown steps which extend to the right and the left the limits of which i am not conscious of since i look neither to the left nor to the right the steps give no indication of leading to any given destination the highest visible level of the steps is a flat rectangular slab the limited vision offers possibilities of the steps continuing in any or all directions rising or descending the slab acting as a respite for the otherwise unbroken strata of steps people are strewn all over in groups in twos threes or singles walking mostly sitting and resting a while all seem to be on a pilgrimage a masaya has been assigned to every group as we proceed i see the prophetess of the group nearest to me she has a scarf tied round her head gypsy fashion wears a long flowing robe and perhaps a few beads strung around her neck she is announcing one amongst you is destined to be a painter the dress of that one shall change color just then the sun is eclipsed and darkness gradually but swiftly descends i gaze down at my dress wondering i am wearing the black brown dress with red dots in the descending darkness i see the dots changing from red to green to yellow the prophet speaks again the spots shall turn white all vision is swallowed in darkness as swiftly the sun shows itself and i see the dots on my dress are white i feel innocent on my waking the dream revived in my mind's eye a glow in my heart on my face and lips ears and nose in the depths of me monday july 2 1973 before sunrise early morning dreams are supposed to come true this one certainly did All of us have a space within where we experience many different emotions and feelings. Some sort of a drama is constantly going on, and we, at times we are spectators, at times actors, and at times both. Isn't that so? We are also both at times. Each work in this series is someone, a being, an entity that is showing us the drama going on inside a space. now this this work has the title of the uh, of the uh, show inscribed on the top edge staging the sets and according to me that makes it the theme painting of the show like we have a theme song kabhi kabhi mere dil mein like that this is the theme painting of the show so normally the stage is set but here it is the other way round the sets are being staged the title staging the sets refers to the performative space of theater so here it's like i've used the back of the canvas and this black form is a detachable form and it it sort of alludes to the you know in uh, folk theater we have the um, character of uh, ganpati ganesh who pass, uh, passes by on the stage Uh, against the drawn curtain so on the proscenium stage to sort of uh, where people are singing propitiating it please remove all obstacles and let our performance be successful this figure sort of is like half elephant and half uh, man passing through the proscenium
All these works have different shapes. They are not just neutral rectangles or squares. Just as I have a shape, you have a shape, the ladder has a shape, the camera has a shape. Each of these works have a shape. I have titled the works. So each work has a distinctly shaped body and is a distinct being. I have titled the works as though they were individual characters in this performance called Staging the Sets. This particular work is called Genie. Genie as in the trapped spirit in a bottle, which we call Genie. By the way, my titles come after I finish the work and I'm looking at them uh, quite some time after I finish them. And then whatever response I, they, they sort of induce in me, the titles come from there. Do you see the skeletal frame here which I have used? Can you spot it or do I need to point it out? There is a there is a people leaf here and also in parts it's here. This is a cutout, it's a it's a void form here, and partly the people leaf is affixed to it from behind. How uh, so again, you know how the people leaf has disappeared into the background. It just doesn't stand out at all. It's a material which is more non-material than material. So what is happening here in these works? They are performing before us through making visible the inner landscape they carry within their bodies. And the concept here, the space within. The way I experience the space within me is what has visually been given form here. This is the last work of this series, it's called Cupid's Arrow. Here if you notice uh, a new material has come into play, wood, it's just wood and paper, rope, thread, all that has disappeared, fabric no longer there. Cupid's Arrow appears like a formidable primitive weapon capable of wounding deeply I would say, but look at the edges which shows, you know, there's a, there's a tinge of green on the edge of this wooden uh, support. Green for growth, for joy, for life. So however deep the wound may be made by the cupid's arrow, the pain most likely will be agonizing but exquisite. In Rome, we all know we have to do as the Romans do. But in India, what do we do? If we try to do as the Indians do, we won't know what hit us. We would be swamped under a plethora of multiplicities. Caste, creed, color, spoken dialects, written languages, dress codes, protocols, white lies, pink slips, black markets, political parties, oral traditions. So in India, my friends, how do we go about doing what we have to do? Untold stories. A 50-minute solo performance written and performed by me. It, it has been performed at different venues across the country and abroad. What I just enacted is a piece from this performance. To give you a brief outline of the concept, at this juncture in my life, I am entering the recesses of my mind and pulling out things, pulling out memories and uh, insights gleaned over a lifetime. It is a collage of implicitly connected episodes, both factual and fictitious, often laced with a tongue-in-cheek humor. The multiple strands of the various episodes, the stories which are revealed up to a point, represent endless doorways which open their spaces for entering and exploring. Each space that we tra travel through leads to the next, to the next. 
suggesting that there is not one core self but a number of selves like layers of an onion. This work, like my visual work, becomes a metaphor for life, the seamless, endless journey that is life. And it's also a kind, uh, the main is that it's a collage, it's built out of fragments, just as my other work has been built out of fragments, which come together on the same surface to make one whole. Before the dawn of civilized society, art was created in the spirit of non-entity. Artist's name was not in the picture, literally and metaphorically. Who done it was unimportant. To please the gods and appease their appetites was of prime importance. Procreation envisages a he and a she at play as one, inspiring their twain selves to turn liquid and meld. So does creating art. Envisage the same. By default, art is not a solo performance. It cannot be made without another who is none but yourself. Id and ego, intellect and intuition, the constant and the variable, the nameless and the named, these dancing wooly masters masterminding the play from behind the curtain. Blessed is the womb that gives birth in solitude, for her seed, not she, shall prevail. We come to L for love, for love, for love, for love, for love. It's a video work which I did, uh, I think last year, for a show called Text as Text, which was curated by Shubha Lakshmi Shukla. And uh, we were briefed to use text as our material, not canvas paper, but text. So I wrote a piece and when I was reweaving it, I felt it should be heard. So I audioed it and then it's turned into a video, <coughs> which we shall see now. But before I start the video, it's uh, the L4 video work is my way of countering the present day despondency pervading our <coughs> social environment and create space for joy and playfulness to reclaim their existence in our daily lives. So can somebody help me? L for lemon, for lonesome, for litmus, for let go, for leap, for light, L for love, 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 L for lovely, for lipstick, for lick, for linger, for limp, for laugh. L for love, for love, for love, for love, for love, for love, 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 love. L for longing. For living, for link, for leading, for lead, for load. L for lost, for look out, for lust. L for love. For love, for love, for love, for love, 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 for least, for like, for leave me, for love, for long, for leggings, for liniment, for litmus, L for love, for love, for love, 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 love. O for orange, for orbit, for obsess, for ozone, for Orlando, for oh yes. O for over, 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 for over, for over, over, for over, for over, for over, 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 over. 
oh for oh my god osmosis ontology for obsolete obscure obdurate o for over and over and over and over and over for over for over 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 o for omnibus for orgasm for obituary for ogle for ostracize for okay o for orifice for olfactory for o la la for over and over and over and over 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 and over and over and over over oh oh for odious for oriental for obcs for off for on for obfuscate o for olive for oscillate for om shanti shanti o for over for over 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 v for vibhyo for volatile for victory for venom for vixen for venus v for vincent for vincent for vincent for vincent for vincent van go vincent for vincent for vincent 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 v for vagabond for vilify for vociferous for virility and vulnerability for vincent for vincent for vincent for vincent van go for vincent 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 v for vagina for verify for venom for vim and for vigor v for vindicate for venerate for very and vilify v for Vincent for Vincent for Vincent for Vincent van go for Vincent V for voracious for vapid for voulez-vous for via vis-a-vis and vistar V for votive and vote for vortex for volt V for Vincent for Vincent for Vincent van go for Vincent for Vincent 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 E for ellipse for elite for every day for escape for enemy for evidence E for ever for ever for ever ever for ever ever for ever for ever for ever 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 E for ermen for elastic for empathy for entrails for egg for embittered E forever for ever forever ever forever 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 ever 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 e for effulgence for effrontery for erotic for eros for enfold for eclectic enough e for enough for elsewhere for essential e for ever forever forever ever forever ever 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 e for endurance for empathy for ebony and ecstasy for epiphany i lashes electric and esoteric e for exit forever 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 ever ever forever for ever 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 l for lemon for lonesome for litmus for let go for leap for light l for love 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 l for lovely for lipstick for lick for linger for limp for laugh l for love for love for love for love for 
love, for love, 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 love. Hell for longing. For living, for link, for leading, for led, for load. L for lost, for look out, for lust. L for love, for love, for love, for love, for love, 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 love. L for let me. For least, for like, for leave me, for love, for long, for leggings, for liniment, for litmus. L for love, for love, for love, 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 love. O for orange, for orbit, for obsess, for ozone, for Orlando, for oh yes. O for over, 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 for over, for over, over, for over, for over, for over, 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 over. O for oh my god, osmosis, ontology, for obsolete, obscure, obdurate. O for over, and over, and over, and over, and over. For over, for over, 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 over. O for omnibus, for orgasm, for obituary. For ogle, for ostracize, for okay. Oh, for orifice, for olfactory, for ooh la la. For over, and over, and over, and over, 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 and over, and over, and over, over. Oh, oh, for odious, for oriental, for OBCs. For off, for on, for obfuscate. Oh, for olive, for oscillate. For Om Shanti Shanti. O for over. For over. Over, over, over. V for Vibhyo, for volatile, for victory. For Venom, for Vixen, for Venus. V for Vincent, for Vincent, for Vincent, for Vincent, for Vincent Van Gogh. Vincent, for Vincent, for Vincent, 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 Vincent. V for Vagabond, for Vilify, for Vociferous, for Virility and Vulnerability, for Vincent. For Vincent, for Vincent, for Vincent Van Gogh, for Vincent, 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 Vincent. Vincent, Vincent. V for vagina, for verify, for venom, for vim and for vigor. V for vindicate, for venerate, for very and vilify. V for Vincent, for Vincent, for Vincent, for Vincent Van Gogh, for Vincent. V for voracious, for vapid, for voulez-vous, for via, vis-a-vis and vistar. V for votive and vote, for vortex, for volt. V for Vincent, for Vincent, for Vincent Van Gogh, for Vincent, for Vincent, 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 Vincent. E for ellipse, for elite, for every day, for escape, for enemy, for evidence. E for ever, for ever, for ever, ever. Forever, ever, forever, 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 ever, 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 ever. E for ermine, for elastic, for empathy, for entrails, for egg, for embittered. E forever, 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 ever, forever, 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 ever, 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 ever. E for effulgence, for effrontery, for erotic, for eros, for enfold, for eclectic, enough. E for enough, for elsewhere, for essential. E for ever, forever, forever, ever, forever, ever, 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 ever. E for endurance, for empathy, for ebony and ecstasy, for epiphany, eyelashes, electric and esoteric.
E for exit. Forever. Forever, forever, ever, ever, forever, forever, ever, 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 ever. Hi, my name is Papaja, and I was um, so fascinated by the dynamic between a kind of skepticism which made you kind of experiment and uh, entertain doubt, and also almost something like a kind of faith. Um, that's uh, almost something affirmative, if not the spiritual, maybe spiritual. I wonder if you want to speak to that about art, about about your journey, uh, well, and the metaphor, the metaphor of the role, maybe. Uh, yeah, that was very clearly there. Yeah. You know, I was trying to, uh, I was trying to give uh, where the art is coming from, from what kind of experience during the process <coughs> of the journey. So even when we, so the rope form happened long ago, but it was not being uh, manifested as a form. It had to like the child has to be there for nine months before it can make its appearance. In the same way, this had to gestate within me, cook within me. And then when the time was ripe, I began doing rope. And then I had to face the question, why rope? So, digging inside, I always like to know where the images are coming from because I don't start with a preconceived image or a preconceived notion of what I'm going to do. I sit and I let myself, <coughs> again, it's a charge. You charge yourself and then you are in that space totally with the atmosphere and the materials and uh, you, you are prepared, you are prepared to hear, you are prepared to receive whatever, whatever nudges or whatever signs you are getting and pick it up and start playing with it. So that has been my learning process and that is what I love to surprise myself and that is where the surprises come from. That I never knew it, this was possible for me to make or, you know. So, I find art making worth it because of that. Because of this kind of uh, knowing yourself more and more, you know, that way. So, yes, it is linked to knowing yourself more. So, you can call it spiritual if you like, but it's more experiential. And it, it, it's like a stepping outside the narrow confines of our everyday life and trying to see what life is about even beyond that. Sure. No, I, I, just, yeah. I just meant spiritual in the sense of a struggle rather than, you know, like yeah. a certainty or a self-certainty. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Uh, Kati, uh, the only other artist I have seen who can um, lucidly speak about is Art is Prabhakar Garve you talked about. Mm -hmm. And this is such a beautiful um, experience to uh, hear the artist or read the artist, like Prabhakar wrote the blank canvas. How important is it for an artist to share the inward journey for people to understand? Well, firstly, the inward journey takes place because I have this urgent 
urgent uh, need to know my own what is cooking inside me. I mean, what all can I draw out? And 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 when I experience something, what is happening to that experience? How am I digesting it? So it's a quest, firstly, to know myself, know what's going on, and then in the process you gain the clarity, which shapes your artwork, and we can share it then when the occasion arises if there is interest yes because it is interesting to know how one arrives at a, a, a tangible form to something which is so intangible to begin with so Bharti, how did you move from uh, tangible physical artworks to performance art because that's completely a different yeah, it's a different idiom, but uh, as I told you, I also had a little background in theatre and I also loved theatre, uh, which has stayed with me. And if you see, the strategies which I have evolved, the vocabulary of my visual work is very dramatic. I mean, there are principles of drama involved in that. So drama has already always been there with me, but let's say a few years ago, it was in 2012, 2013 that I had this very bad urge to write something and that was a time which was fallow for me as far as making art is concerned but I wanted to write. I didn't know what I wanted to write. I wanted to write very badly. So I started writing. One thing led to another and again when I was, of course, a lot of things has gone into the dustbin but the final edited version I felt should not be just uh, read out. The, I did performances like that. I went to people's homes, 10 people, 15 people. I would sit and, you know, do a reading performance. Like It began like that, but it developed into a theatre, uh, regular, with, with, with sets and everything, which was a collaboration again with Jill Sarr. Did the come on your body and face when you were doing that? Because it, uh, the whole episode refers to that. It's, I've, I've gone through something and the color blue, that is the mood, that is the atmosphere of that chunk and so the blue, uh, but again it is not so obvious over there, so you have to see the performance <laughs> to know that. I wouldn't call it a bad birch, you use the word bad birch. No, I didn't. I had an urge. I had an urge to write, a very... There was a word before ah. urge. I badly, that badly Bad needed you. to, that way. <laughs> <laughs> you missed badly. Huh. Thanks, Bhakti, for being able to talk. It's lovely to hear you talk about your work yeah. and your whole experience of creating art in whichever form. Uh, but my question is about the, the process that you went to, the experiment that you did about uh, not following your inner voice and yeah. forcing yourself to do good <coughs> things. Yeah. And I find, I relate to that a lot, but I, I, the question is like, how do you keep, like the, I think doubt remains, it seems to me at least right now, for me if I'm creating the doubt is present, but to go to that other state, well, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. you see, um, it's, um, of course, when you're practicing art for a number of years, the more you practice, the more you get the knack of recognizing. Recognizing when that feel is happening, when you are getting, you know, uh, that contact with your own self and things are sparked, that spark is there or not, whether it's dead or alive. At least that you recognize. And then you slowly go with the flow. I mean, there is, so once you are there, then there is no doubt. Before yeah. that, yes, but before that, not a doubt, but things are not happening, what to do? <laughs> that way, that feeling is there. So, uh, I'm really interested in what the difference is for you in uh, following the inner voice when it's something so close as something you're touching with your own hands and working alone versus uh, working with other people in a theater context or making videos, I mean, there must be lots of people involved and, and how do you uh, pursue your new voice differently when other people are involved in that way compared to by yourself? 
Well, this whole discipline of theatre is very, very different. I, I mean, you are not in an ivory tower when, when you're performing or when you're developing a performance. So to accept, once, I, once uh, I'm okay with the director or with the light, light, uh, lighting designer, all the people concerned, then I, I accept their, their uh, instructions. I discuss it out. But when I am on stage, I'm performing, then I'm totally with myself. Then it, it is almost like uh, working one to one with, with the material. So then it is, yeah, again there is that tadat here, that oneness. It has to be there. Otherwise, it's, it's a dead, dead thing. Urgently want to ask you, why is it necessary? Not why is it necessary, but I've observed that you find it very necessary to give explanations to yourself on why you are doing a certain work or realizing a certain work. Is, why is this need to fully explain to yourself and to people like us who are listening to you. This explanation sometimes, you know, does less and takes away from the visual or the sound that you are making on in your own work. This absolutely consuming need to find out why I'm doing this. I mean, why is it there? Yeah, so can I try to answer your question? Firstly, it is not uh, why I am doing it. As, as when I was painting ropes, I had no interest in knowing why. But there is a question and I am doing my work. I want it to be shareable. I want people to respond to the work. And people cannot respond if they do not find a connection to the work. They cannot. That's the first thing that has to happen is there has to be some connection that you feel with, with your life, with your experience and what is happening with the visual inside you. So the urge is not so much as to, to find out why I'm doing it, but the urge is to, uh, to get my, uh, get, to understand what that soil is or, or uh, where am I getting it from? Or, you know, is, is it up north, is it south, is it westwards, where, where does the land lie, which direction I'm, I'm looking at, I'm trying to explore. Because where the flow that I'm going in, I don't decide that I want to go here, so I'm going there. It, 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 it evolves, it has evolved over the years, because to start with there is an urge to uh, to find out more about life, to be able to reach that point when my heart beats together with life, the, the rhythm of life, the pulse of life. So that is the thrust of my wanting to know also. It's trying to dig yourself out and, and know, expose what's happening or what is it, what am I? It's but one way of... Uh, but cannot one live with the unknown? And with ambivalences. Of course, you can live with the unknown, and, but I don't want to. <laughs> See, I don't want to. It's, it's just know, like that. I, I want to know. I want to know what is happening. It is transitory. It may change after two years. I may break out of that frame again. Yes, that is. I want to break out of frames and enter new frames and see where I where have I landed again. So it's trying to recognize the, your place of domain or domicile or whatever. There's so much sensuousness in your work. You, you, you yes, it is. So I'm just telling you where it's coming from. It's uh, up to the people to interpret it and take what they can. The visual, so that, you see, I have revealed it up to a point. But then how you can interpret the work, how you can receive it, is something else. It's another talk altogether. Which is a good idea. <laughs> the question is very nice, but the thing is also that very often when someone is questioning anything in life about oneself, you know, very often clarity emerges in the expression of what you are. So it's not a question of why you are doing it. 
there is a necessity to express it and that then clarity emerges. Yeah, yeah. That's what yeah, that is, I mean, yeah. it is to gain clarity as to why I am doing what I am doing. So that I can even proceed further. बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया भागी जी बहुत कुछ सीखने को मिला लाइक योर हार्ट इज लाइक मी वी अदर इज नॉट टू लर्न फ्रॉम यू बिकॉज यू नो हाउ टू आई मीन आई थिंक यू आर योर परफॉर्मेंस आर्टिस्ट यू परफॉर्म एंड इवन वेर यू पेंट यू इज प्लेइंग इट यू नो इन दैट सेंस एंड इट्स समथिंग यू टू लर्न फ्रॉम गेन अ लॉट फ्रॉम बट माई माई क्वेश्चन वॉज अगेन that uh, do you see any difference between like uh, there's always a staging and it's well, it is part of theater uh, but when we talk about contemporary performance art uh, like are you planning or i don't know how do you differentiate from that like for your own practice or uh, like how do you look at it i just want to understand this well uh, if it there are two questions here one is my own practice how i see it and one is by and large there is a difference between performing a performance art in fine arts and theater there is a distinct difference but as far as my practice is concerned i am interested in bringing the two together like you know exploring dimensions of both and building one whole out of that mm -hmm. You have been constantly mentioning about the right time. Uh, there is a right time that comes to you, and that the flow begins. Uh, when the right time doesn't come to you, or when there is a test of your patience, what would you do? <laughs> Break my head, <laughs> run away, make a phone call, eat something, anything. <laughs> that you have not just on the internet on the screen but in life it's uh, forever and ever and <laughs> ever and <laughs> ever till i live i guess i want to ask one question uh, you said you title later yeah and first let your work flows i want to ask something is it titling is necessary or you just want to Uh, it happens. I I think it it makes it uh, it gives it an added interest if, if I title it. Like I said, that work is titled Genie, the Trapped Spirit. Mm -hmm. I'm not painting a bottle with a spirit inside, but I call it Genie. It intrigues. It draws you inside. Okay. Or you can leave it. You can forget it. What's in a name? But I feel it lends a, a point of entry and point of interest. adds to it so when you name it is there a danger of you diverting the receiver's attention in another direction but that that's what i just said because they are not describing my work i'm not saying a portrait with a, a cat or a, a you know a portrait with a tear in whatever i'm not describing the painting i'm not telling you what not, it is not. i'm saying but the title that, yeah Maybe where will be looking for a genie? Well, for example, they can a genie. Where is the genie? Yeah, exactly. Here? Can't see any genie. Leave it, na. Then see what is there. You may arrive at what is genie, right? but you know, if you don't, you don't. You would give your own title to it if you want. Otherwise, let it free. Okay. Uh, it's essentially. Um, Um, the difference between fine art, as in painting, and performance art. You can delay if the opportune moment doesn't come in your painting. You can delay it forever, forever, forever. But if there is a performance which is not to be staged at nine o'clock on Sunday, and if you are not in the mood, what do you? It's a flop performance. You yeah, perform. But, then, but it is a. I mean, I'm saying it is a problem with the uh, the the idiom or the genre. Yeah, yeah. So It's a difference. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember one of my professors in in university because I, I when we did a college production, I was really upset after one production because it felt like I wasn't there. And he said, "No, but you don't understand. What you did automatically is you fell back on your craft. So when you may feel that you weren't as present 
mm. as you would have liked to be. Mm. Often in a live performance, if your craft is good enough, the craft will carry you through. So it will be at certain levels of truth, but it will still be in the space of truth, which is different from, I think, the way visual arts works. Is there a bridge you find or you discover or you, you're exploring? What is the nature of that? Well, since I'm practicing fine arts, visual arts, and also theater to an extent, I also read, I also write. So all these things make their appearance. Now whether to take them further, whether to discard them, whether to let them in is up to me. So there's no formula as to, you know. Uh, I don't think I have a question, but rather an observation. I've heard you a couple of times present your work, and I feel every time it's more sophisticated sort of, um, sort of level you have arrived mm -hmm. at presenting uh, your work. So uh, on that question of explanation, I think it's, you're a performer at heart, and I think every time you share your work, it's almost like forms, um, and uh, it reconnects you with the audience and uh, I think uh, that's, that's just an observation, not a question, but we can respond to it. So it's more like when you talk about your work, it's almost like you want to, it's like an opportunity for you to do another performance. So, uh, that's very astute, you're right. <laughs> I, I love to perform, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just, just, <laughs> just a second that I, I, I didn't think of the word as an explanation or communication, but really as expressive. Right. It's like part of it. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think sure. that he said that. Yeah. I agree with you what you said, like I also feel the same. And it is really amazing that like I want to learn that from you. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a difference between performing and acting. So and I think you're a you're performing. Ah, okay. You and, just uh, yeah, like you make a distinction. <laughs> I, I like yeah. I think that is. So you also title your work very symbolically. So it's like you're not uh, fixing an idea. You're leaving it open. That and it, in, in your video it is explainable. People can. So one word can have many interpretations, diff like different uh, mm. understanding perspectives too. So I think your titles are also very open, like mm. already. So yeah. okay, thank you. I think we can take a couple more questions. Are there already? Would that also talk about the level of confidence that you have while performing, so that you are actually trying to perform? You are sure as to what the outcome is to be. You are leading it towards a specific direction. What is your question? The level of confidence that you have. Yeah, so I mean, with every performance, the confidence does is meant to increase. Now, whether it increases or not, it is, what can I say, solely dependent on you. How. Um, how um, dissatisfied you are with your performance, how, how you see the possibilities of uh, going further with that. And, and that builds up your confidence, you know, discovering new ways of saying the same thing. I mean, just because we've rehearsed and set it, doesn't mean that every time it has to be done in the same way, especially not with a performance like what I have written. It can be uh, performed in different ways, with a completely different it can be half mocking, it can be very serious, it can, you know, it can vary, the, the tonal uh, variations can vary, so that is the fun of, of, of performing, I feel. So that, that tentative, not tentative, but that uncertainty, because nothing is that way fixed really. You leave it open, partly open, partly there. You take that risk and taking that risk is something which is very exciting and very worth it. Like in life, we don't know what is going to happen one week later or even tomorrow. So we're taking a risk, we're taking a chance. Similarly, 
I guess. But about confidence, I, I don't know what you mean. Where am I getting from the confidence? Just as when I'm painting, I get it from myself. You get it, that, that, <coughs> that, that connection has to be made even when you are performing. So either it's, if, it do, if it's not there, it's a flop performance. You can feel it. But today, I, it was completely dead. It didn't come alive. Hi, Bharti. I'm here again. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed uh, and mm -hmm. uh, just a question, what do you do during, I know you said during the fallow periods you write, you read, you wait, you do all these things, mm -hmm. you know. As an artist, sometimes I find also like yours has been a long journey. So in this journey, have there been times when you thought, I mean, during those periods, you thought, okay, this is it and I can do no more. Like, how do you manage to persist for so long? Because I find that a problem at times. I feel, oh my god, like I'm done with this now. What next? I have no clue. Like, is this over? Well, firstly, there's nothing else I can do except make art. <laughs> <laughs> and also that uh, I uh, find it futile to continue to live if I cannot create something. Mm -hmm. so how do we persist? How do we, like, overcome we, be, we believe in ourselves, we, 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 and of course keep our fingers crossed that something will happen. But we have to, uh, in a way, trust ourselves. All these years, it has been with us. Given a chance, yourself never lets you down is what I've written true. in my diary a number of years ago. That's a nice one. That's actually true. Yeah, so that, that's what has pulled me through so far. When you were saying confidence, I sensed you meant belief in self. And you're asking a question about self-belief. Um, and uh, the question that I have, because I have a I thoughts on this, the question that I have is when you're creating work, who are you primarily creating it for? Uh, yeah, it's a very, very interesting question. Uh, I'm never, I am basically creating um, because there's a need to create. It's not for somebody, for me, myself. But I am never without the, the concept or the imaginary audience, the person with, who may share or who may feel excited about what I'm doing. That person is me. I mean, I'm carrying that with me. So when I'm looking at my work after it's complete, it is that person is sitting in the chair and looking at the work and getting a response from where the title comes. So I'm never divorced from from the other. Yeah, because some of the questions I feel, and I may be wrong, but some of the anxieties I feel that we often feel in other fields about how will somebody else put up a proof of my work. I wonder That phase how one how goes it's through. Not, yeah. It's not that really. It's just that you feel, and then, I mean, you do come to, now I realize, I think you accept that if for the rest of my life nothing happens, nothing happens. I have to go through it. Yeah. And when the muse left Tom Morais for 20 years, he didn't write poetry until the muse hit him. And when the muse, uh, who was it now? The old man in the sea? Hemingway. Oh, yeah. When the muse left Hemingway, he committed suicide. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure <laughs> 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 Do you have any further questions? Yeah, I have uh, something to share actually. Right. Coming to um, Marty's we'll performance. Uh, do you think I do? No, we just because of you know, okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, This is the second time I'm uh, hearing and seeing her work. The first time she did it was in my college. And they were, it was for my students. 
Okay, so uh, as a performer, he knew how to talk to their students who were in the first year, second year, and their appreciation of art actually increased. Many of them even talked to her of because of the insights that she gave into uh, the painting. Like uh, uh, Mr. Fani said, it was important for an art appreciation kind of a situation. Maybe not for uh, you know evolved uh, uh, critiques or whatever, but for students it is a must. I feel you know this kind of an insight into an artist's work. Yeah. So thank you very very much. I'm I'm so happy that you called me.